From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead for you today, K-State's Lucas Haig will look at the timing of weed control following wheat harvest in a dry land cropping system. From the water conservation standpoint, he'll cite a multi-year K-State study in western Kansas that shows the advantages of earlier weed control. Then K-State's Brian Brigaman, he'll comment on a new analysis from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, which examined the state of agricultural lending activity in the second quarter of this year. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Judy O'Mara reports that Dutch elm disease is once again attacking American elms in home landscapes. She'll talk about responding to it. All that and more next on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks for listening in once again for Agriculture Today here on the K-State Radio Network. Well, at this point of the production season, that is, following the wheat harvest, we often talk about the value of controlling weeds in that wheat stubble. Well, in dry land cropping systems, especially in western Kansas, where there's a fallow component to those systems, that post-harvest weed control is ever more important. And that was illustrated in a a series of studies over several years conducted by K-State. Reporting on this work now with us is the Northwest Area Agronomist for K-State Research and Extension, Lucas Haig. Lucas is actually out working with test plots in Sherman County today, so he steps aside for a few moments to join us. Well, Lucas, the importance here in as far as this work was the impact of controlling those weeds on available moisture in that system, correct? Yeah, so not surprisingly, Eric, you know, in this eight-year study uh, that we ran at Tribune, you, you know, we know in our dry land cropping systems, we're water limited. And so uh, trying to find that trade-off between how much water we allow weeds to consume, uh, you know, at some point will negatively impact us on the next crop. And so so the context of this rotation is kind of our, our typical uh, wheat corn fallow or wheat sorghum fallow type rotation. So again, that wheat stubble, uh, that we're going to try and keep clean so we can plant it to row crop next spring. And what you were expressly interested in here was the timing of that weed control and how it would affect moisture availability to the following crop. Right. So this is actually a follow-up study uh, to some previous work that had been done in a wheat fallow system. Uh, and actually in wheat fallow, we showed that we could allow some weeds to grow after harvest, delay control until spring, provide better habitat for pheasants and actually not negatively impact the system in terms of yields or profitability. So the question was, okay, when we move from wheat fallow to something more intensive, so wheat corn fallow, wheat sorghum fallow, could we do that same type of approach? And so we had three timings of of weed control. So uh, a July weed control, so basically immediately after wheat harvest, uh, and then we delayed control either until uh, mid to late August, or in the third treatment, we actually did no weed control in the fall and then uh, and then started in the in the spring. So, uh, you know, three pretty, pretty drastic ranges of, of options there, I guess, so to speak. And what you were seeking here, not just a general view of water conservation within the system, but looking at that from several different perspectives, if you will. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, there's there's also, uh, you know, depending upon how much wheat residue we have, there's there's an argument that sometimes we'd be better off to grow a little something, be that weeds or a cover crop to grow some residue that then can help us save water uh, later on. But what we found in this, Eric, was is even when we delayed weed control until uh, uh, August, at the time we'd done that, we already had uh, four tenths of an inch more water where we had controlled the weeds back in July versus where we were controlling them in, in August. And so already almost a half inch ahead in terms of water. And that was basically, you know, mostly in the top foot and a half of, of the profile. 
But anyways, then when we stretch that out, if we allowed the weeds to grow till October, you know, basically we were talking about um, losing another uh, over half an inch water before that point in time. So, you know, fairly substantial difference starts adding up uh, the longer we let these weeds grow. You even took it one further then and looked at abstaining from weed control until the following spring as well? Yeah, and so in that situation, uh, when we did not uh, allow anything, uh, did not do any control until the spring, uh, you know, we had uh, substantially less soil water uh, all the way through the profile, um, really all the way down through the bottom of the six-foot profile. When we come around to corn planting that spring, uh, where we had allowed the weeds to grow, we had significantly less water at every depth in the in the profile. And even in the August treatment, we had slightly less water at several of the depths. And the thing is, where these, uh, you know, where we'd seen these reductions in water, uh, those persisted all the way through July in the growing corn crop. And so measured at tassel silk in the growing corn crop, we could still see the relative differences of when we initiated weed control after harvest. So, and that would suggest, and this makes perfect sense, that these depletions in water, the later you control those weeds, would then translate into yield impacts successively negative as you go down the calendar. Yeah, so not, uh, I mean, they're not terribly surprising. And and again, we ran this study in uh, 2001 through 2008, and so those are some pretty tough uh, years there at Tribune, so we don't got the the best uh, dryland corn yields. But averaged across the eight-year study, we averaged 51 bushel for the July uh, weed control treatment, 47 for the August. But then when we didn't control weeds until spring, uh, that basically knocked us down to a 36 bushel uh, average. You know, we look in some of the better years there. So like in 2004, 2005, uh, where we had controlled weeds immediately after wheat harvest, we were raising some 67, 68 bushel dryland corn. Uh, where we had waited till August to control the weeds, we were about 59 bushel, and then uh, we were at 50 bushel or less uh, where we had allowed weeds to grow in, uh, throughout the fall. Uh, so basically about a 15, 16 bushel spread for, you know, across the weed control timings there. So it couldn't be more clear that it's better to treat and control those weeds early. And if one is going to do so, obviously, Lucas, they need to be sure that they are in fact, achieving a high level of control, lest they have to come back again. But that is the prescription here, basically. Right. And so certainly, you know, and that's it's certainly, uh, you know, challenging today with Palmer Amaranth and all of our resistance issues. And so, you know, we've got some tools that are out there. Uh, would really uh, hear just uh, two weeks ago or so in the e-update, uh, we had uh, some articles about uh, some of those different post-harvest weed control options. Certainly Paraquad is a very valuable tool that we can use to get those, uh, get a rapid burn down on those tough to control weeds. And it's fairly cost effective as well. But we got to be mindful of the conditions we're spraying it, make sure we're partnering it with the right other products in the tank to heat it up a little bit and, and using the proper adjuvants and enough gallonage uh, as, as well. Perfect plug there for the chemical weed control guide out of K-State, by the way, to look at post-wheat harvest herbicide options for controlling in a dry land system. And there's one more cause here we might slip in as well, Lucas, and that is, yes, one is following with a feed grain after that wheat crop, but for others in the neighborhood who might be going to wheat the next year, there is a, a certain stewardship attached to controlling that volunteer wheat right after harvest, too, so... That can be accomplished likewise here. Absolutely. You know, it's that time of year where uh, we really need to start thinking about, especially where, you know, fortunately in some areas of the state, we've gotten some decent rains. So we've got some heavy flushes of volunteer that will be coming on. And so keeping in mind, you know, really uh, for some of our areas where we'll have, you know, we'll see some early planning, uh, you know, you know, September 15th or, or actually even earlier over in, uh, you know, areas of Hamilton, Stanton, Greeley counties, we're not that far away from really needing to start that two-week interruption in, in Greenbridge. So it's time to be paying attention to what we've got for volunteer out there and be a good neighbor. All right. want to note you're involved in a, a number of interesting crop field trials, likewise, in uh, northwest Kansas. You're working with pea crops. You're also working with spring wheat, we're told. So you're going to have some interesting data coming forth. Yeah, I actually just uh, cut those plots uh, last night, and so we'll have this be our second year of running a 
uh, spring wheat variety trial. And then we also did a, a spring wheat uh, seeding rate trial. And then we're fortunate, you know, we uh, work well with our uh, counterparts to the north. Uh, UNL actually had a spring wheat trial just across the state line at McCook. And so between their data and our data, uh, we'll hopefully have some uh, some better guidelines, uh, some information we can provide our producers up here who have an interest in spring wheat. Well, when all of that data comes together, we'd like to tap you for some of that information as well. Your general sense of it, though, before we let you go, spring wheat, does it have a future in Kansas crop productivity? You know, it's certainly going to have, it's got some challenges going forward, and we've certainly thrown a very difficult year at it this year in terms of heat. Um, and, and we know that's the million dollar question is getting it finished before we hit it with stress uh, here in, in our environment. And so uh, in our variety trial that we cut last night, yields uh, were typically in that mid to low 20s uh, range. But it always goes back, Eric, we got to think about the economics of the whole system. And so if we can if it can be used as a uh, fallow replacement tool, fallow alternative. And the other million dollar question here is quality. You know, the stuff only has a market value if it's the type of quality that millers uh, and bakers can use. Right. Well, looking forward to hearing more about that prospect as you put that data together and uh, assimilate it here very soon. But for our main topic here, post-harvest weed control and dry land cropping systems, we'd have our producers take a look at an article which covers all of this in full in the Agronomy E-Update newsletter this past week at agronomy.ksu.edu. Lucas, as always, thanks, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Eric. Northwest Area Extension Crop Production Specialist for K-State. He's based out of Colby in northwest Kansas. That's Lucas Haig. And you're tuned to Agriculture Today. When we come back, a closer look at a new report on agricultural lending trends here in the central part of the nation as they shaped up during these last few tumultuous months, to put it that way. That's next here on the K-State Radio Network. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, a look at the status of agricultural credit in the region. This on the heels of a new report just out a few days back from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. It looked at agricultural lending trends over the second quarter, which was just finished up. What we're doing now is asking for input from our guest who actually spent time at the Kansas City Fed out of the Omaha branch before arriving at Kansas State University several years ago. He's the director of the Arthur Capper Cooperative Center in the K-State Department of Agricultural Economics. Once more, a pleasure to talk with Brian Brigham, who's on the road today, and we appreciate you taking a few moments to pass along your interpretations of what this report had to say, Brian. And is this something that the Fed regularly provides and updates that is uh, a condition report on agricultural lending? Yes, Eric. The Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, along with a couple of the other banks within the Federal Reserve System, such as the Chicago Fed, the Dallas Fed, really focus and do a lot of work within agriculture and rural communities, primarily because in the Kansas City Fed, the district that they serve, um, agriculture is a big part of their industry. So they need to understand what is going on with farmers, ranchers, producers, and rural areas. So this, especially at the KC Fed, uh, something that they follow quite closely. And in fact, they base this information off of a survey of agricultural lenders and lenders broadly that's conducted routinely. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. They certainly survey within their district, but they also survey across the whole nation to gather insights and input from lenders and then also look at lending data directly from banks. So it's a a very good report to follow. 
They collect the Agricultural Credit Survey, which is for the 10th district, for the KC Fed district, but they also do the Ag Finance Data Book, which looks more broadly across uh, the entire U.S., and that is the report you are referring to for the second quarter of 2020. Well, let's look at uh, some of the things they discovered upon that survey for the, the second quarter, and generally speaking, they say that Agricultural financing activity slowed down in the second quarter, and uh, one has to think that given all of the disruptions that have gone on over the past few months, that really doesn't come as a a terrific surprise, does it? No, it does not. Um, And I think what you're seeing is a lot of uh, farmers and ranchers are reacting to the downturn within the ag economy, which is closely tied to the shutdown that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you said, you saw a lot of the slowing of activity, in particular on loans. One of the things that jumped out at me was if you look at the breakdown of the different types of non-real estate loans, so you can look at operating, machinery, purchases, kind of across the board what you saw was a retrenching by farmers and ranchers. During times of financial stress, farmers and ranchers will focus in on how do I manage my costs, but also, too, how do I make sure I can build up enough liquidity, working capital, or short-term available funds so I can get through this time of not only stress, but also uncertainty. And if one particular sector you saw really pull back on their types of non real estate loans was in the theater cattle arena. And that makes a lot of sense given that the with the COVID-19 pandemic leading to shutdowns of bars and restaurants, we had tremendous amount of stress on our food supply chains. And I, I know you've done a number of talks with some of our livestock economists in the Ag Econ department like Glenn Tonzer, Dustin Pendle. All of that is kind of showing up in that ag credit data to see a significant drop in those feeder cattle uh, non-real estate loans directly tied to what happened uh, during the shutdown. They also note in the report that operating loans were in decline in volume over this past quarter. What does that suggest to you? Well, I think part of it is just really managing your costs and realizing, yes, I need to, uh, you know, in the second quarter, so here in Kansas, putting fall crop in the ground, Yes, I still need to do that, but I need to be mindful of costs. But also, there was another piece in the report, which was interesting to me to start to see some of that data come through. You do see that many producers in Kansas, but also across the U.S., uh, took advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program. Mm -hmm. So that was a loan that could be forgiven if it was used for things like payroll expenses, at least 75% of the loan needed to be used for payroll, uh, and 25% could be used for other items such as land rental rents, those types of items that were able to, why not, instead of using my operating loan for those type of expenses, let me apply for and receive the Paycheck Protection Program loan and with the opportunity for it to be forgiven if I follow all of the different protocols that go through that. So I do think in the KC Fed, they they are right, Um, at least anecdotally from what I've heard from producers in Kansas, there were a number of folks who did apply for and receive a PPP loan. So that is just a kind of a shifting of that demand, if you will. We have to talk uh, about other specifics that lend to the story here. And interest rates, once more, not big news here, but they have remained over this second quarter of the year at historically low levels. Yeah, interest rates continue to be very low. And, you know, if you look across various like macroeconomists, financial economists who forecast out looking at interest rates, What is the Federal Reserve going to do with interest rates? I think all indications is that they will remain low for quite some time because of all the stress that is going on with the U.S. economy and global economy. And that is low interest rates across the board that, you know, for shorter term operating non-real estate, but also, too, on uh, longer term real estate. So producers are receiving some relief on that. And definitely, you know, if there are 
opportunities for a producer to work with their lender on refinancing uh, a loan. I think there are some real opportunities for them not only to fix in lower, longer-term rates, but also, too, to explore maybe bringing in some mix of variable rate financing. I think for each producer, their comfort level with looking at uh, maybe some additional cost savings for a potentially lower, shorter-term variable rate is worth exploring. So, yes, there are some uh, real opportunities uh, to lock in and to work with uh, even variable lower interest rates. So then, considering this report once more, because of the abnormalities of the pandemic impact, you mentioned the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, that the producers might have turned to for financial needs in lieu of going to commercial banks, agricultural banks. What do these findings out of this report really tell us about farm solvency, do you think, for the uh, longer pull, Brian? Well, I think what it points to is just like what we've seen for a while. There are areas of stress right now. One of the things that does come through in that report is you do see demand for loans is up, but the supply of loans is down. Um, I do think there are some, you know, higher credit standards that are out there. There are other sources in order to pull in loans for maybe those that are stressed, like the PPP loan, like you said before. Um, but also, uh, if you look, delinquency rates, they haven't really shot up in the report, but they've edged up. They've come up some. Mm-hmm. So there are, I think, areas, there are pockets, there are producers out there who are maybe fully stressed, and they're the ones that are coming through on delinquency rates, but it's not across the board. I think from a farm solvency standpoint, in general, for most farmers out there, they're fairly solvent. So they have ample equity to fall back on to get through this time. I think there's still a fair amount of liquidity out there, although that is starting to dwindle with the press prices, not only on grains, uh, oil seed prices, but also on livestock prices, too. So it's not, you know, we're in a deep period of financial stress that we need to be extremely concerned. It's just right now what it points to me is we need to be aware farmers are doing, I feel, what they need to do, manage costs to the best of their ability, build up you know, as much liquidity as they can, be mindful of purchases, uh, especially uh, investments such as in machinery, equipment, purchasing land. You need to make sure that it, it makes sense and fits within your growth plan and meets your goals and objectives. So I wouldn't say that this is, um, you know, a bunch of red flags are going up, but it is a, a point of note that it does bring some concern to those who are following the market, just need to continue to monitor the situation. Well, we appreciate the input on this, Brian. Safe travels as you continue on today. And thanks for taking the time to talk with us about this information. Happy to do so, Eric. And sharing their reflections on a new report out of the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank on agricultural lending in the uh, Central Plains region that that bank covers. That's Brian Brigham, agricultural economist at K-State, and once more formally an economist with the Kansas City Fed. He is, of course, now the director of the Arthur Capper Cooperative Center out of K-State. We'll be back with more for you on this Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here and moving ahead now with today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Senate Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee Chairman John Hoven of North Dakota told DTN yesterday that he believes the Senate coronavirus aid package will contain about the same amount of money for agriculture programs as does the House Heroes Act. Talks continue among Senate Republicans on the final details of an aid package. Hoven said the USDA can start with the $14 billion that was previously allocated to the Commodity Credit Corporation, and Congress will bump that up so that the USDA has about 33 to $35 billion in additional money for farmers. Hoven said by his calculations, the HEROES Act, passed by the House, contains about $68 billion for agriculture, and $33 billion of that, including the $14 billion in CCC money, would be for aid for farmers and ranchers. Now, the USDA could not use the $14 billion until July the 1st, but it can now use that money to pay out the rest of the $16.5 billion promised to producers under the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, according to Hoven. The Senate bill will also contain language giving the USDA discretion to make payments to ethanol plants and aid to livestock producers who had to euthanize animals because they could not get them processed at the packing plant. But Hoven said the authority for USDA to use the CCC payment mechanism for purposes broader than what's in the CCC Charter Act would only be for one year and not a permanent change, as some farm leaders have proposed. The bill would also not permanently increase the CCC spending authority to $50 billion, as had been proposed. And Hoven added he's been working on the agricultural provisions with Senator John Boozman of Arkansas. The two of them have been keeping Senate Agriculture Committee Chairman Pat Roberts of Kansas informed. Of course, Roberts is retiring. Boozman is likely to be the top Republican on the Agriculture Committee next year. Hoven and Boozman also have kept House Agriculture Committee Chairman Colin Peterson and the House Agriculture Ranking Member Michael Conaway in the loop. After months of work, the USDA released a report yesterday summarizing volatility in cattle and beef prices following last summer's Tyson packing plant fire at Holcomb, Kansas, and the loss of packer capacity during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic this spring. Both situations led to record spreads between fed cattle prices and record high boxed beef prices. USDA officials cannot yet say if there were violations of the Packers and Stockyards Act, stating in this report that the investigation into potential violations is continuing. An accompanying news release from the USDA stated that the report does not examine potential violations of the PSA, but that the department continues to work with Department of Justice officials regarding allegations of anti-competitive practices in the meatpacking industry. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue indicated in a statement that work continues to analyze the cattle market. He said that if any unfair practices are detected, the USDA will take quick enforcement action. Now, the report summarizes the reactions of fed cattle and boxed beef prices following that August 9, 2019 fire at Holcomb. That plant is responsible for 5 to 6 percent of daily cattle slaughter, and the fire prompted an immediate shutdown that quickly drove down live cattle prices. The spread between dressed fed cattle prices and the choice boxed beef cutout value reached a then-record $67 per hundredweight after the Holcomb fire. The USDA stated it took about three weeks weeks after that fire for the spread between fed cattle and boxed beef to come down to just over $41. Then this past spring, as the COVID-19 began hitting the U.S. and the country effectively started to shut down, boxed beef values rose while cattle prices were more volatile. From early April, the second week of May, the uh, spread grew from $66 per hundredweight to the new record $279 per hundredweight. Ethan Lane, the vice president of governmental affairs for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, notes that the NCBA had initially requested the USDA investigation. And Lane said that NCBA members are collectively still awaiting the results of the Department of Justice's ongoing investigation into the issues. Next up for you, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. Standing by with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Rosalind Leake, Senior Director of Market Access for the U.S. Soybean Export Council, joins us. And Rosalind, with the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement officially in place, replacing NAFTA, how will this benefit U.S. soybean producers? USMCA coming into effect replacing NAFTA is a, a positive thing for U.S. agriculture, for U.S. soybean farmers. It really is a modernization of the previous NAFTA. So 25 years ago, we couldn't have anticipated some of the changes in trade and the way we do business that have occurred. From a soybean perspective specifically, it didn't change a whole lot. We already had tariff-free access and we had good access. You know, Mexico is our number two market for soybeans, meal, and oil. And Canada is our number four market for soybean meal. And we have high over 90% market share in both of those. So we were already in a very good position. But what this modernization of the agreement did was it brought in some new aspects of things about digital trade and intellectual property provisions, as well as looked at biotech and some of those innovations that we utilize in agriculture and adopted some of the more modern policies around that as well. I would think for Kansas soybean producers, there's an advantage there just because they're kind of halfway between Canada and Mexico. And And I think that beyond just the soybean aspect of it, there was some better access granted for dairy products and for poultry products. So that too has a ripple effect within the agricultural commodity space. And so certainly that can have benefits to Kansas farmers as well as other U.S. farmers. But we have such strong market share in Canada and Mexico. We have have some limited capacity to gain, but certainly as they continue to grow, particularly Mexico, we will be first in line in order to get that business. So say, for instance, the advantages USMCA gives the U.S. Re- regards to our competitors, say like as an example, Brazil for soybeans. So I think one of our strongest advantages is proximity, but certainly when you have a trade agreement as strong and as well established as NAFTA was and now USMCA that just solidifies and forges that trade relationship that we've had for so many years. It just makes it stronger and it gives us a path forward to the future. It shows us that we are committed as the three countries to continue to work on issues of common interest and work on our trade relationships. That's Rosalind Leake, Senior Director of Market Access for the U.S. Soybean Export Council, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, our weekly time set aside to talk horticultural matters. And this time around, we will center on a tree disease, which is notorious by name here in this state and elsewhere. And it still is active in Kansas, we're told by our guest. Dutch elm disease is our topic. And from the Plant Disease Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State, Judy O'Mara has joined us right here. So, Judy, Dutch elm disease in Kansas. Give us an idea of just how prominent it is. Uh, Hi, Eric. Dutch elm disease, it's definitely been around since the 30s. We see a little bit of it every year. But in 2020, we're actually seeing a lot of it. So I would guess that if you were driving down the road uh, in any community and you saw a mature American elm and you saw that the tree was you know, showing symptoms of turning brown and wilting, that there was a pretty decent chance that that tree has Dutch elm disease. It's a horrible disease, and once... The disease gets started, it pretty much kills those trees. How does it spread? The spread, what makes this a serious disease is that it's spread in two ways. One is through insects. Uh, There's some elm bark beetles, the American elm bark beetle and the European bark beetle. And so as the beetles fly between trees, they're actually carrying the fungus on their bodies. And then they, they move underneath the bark and they carry that disease with them. And then the the fungus enters into the tree and it starts damaging the water conducting tissue. And Dutch elm disease takes out the trees pretty quickly. I would say within three to four weeks that that tree will be dead. So the initial symptoms as you do a drive-by, the tree appears to turn brown and wilt. And it actually sort of starts section by section. So a major limb, then another section of the tree and so forth. One of the ways that you can sort of double check to see if it's Dutch elm disease on the ground, 
It's a very quick uh, visual tip. Take a, a tree branch and you pull the bark back on that branch. So maybe pick something about thumb size diameter, pull the bark back. It should be white underneath that bark. But with Dutch elm disease, it produces a very distinctive kind of brown streaking in the wood that is very characteristic for Dutch elm disease. So if I see an elm tree turning off color and browning and scorching and wilting, then I would want to, you know, clip a few branches off and take a look underneath. And if I wasn't really sure, I'd pick a healthy branch for comparison. And I would say, okay, pull the bark back. It looks white. This is what it should look like. And then in the branches that are affected, I would also check underneath the bark and I would see that distinctive streaking in the wood. So that makes for a quick on-site assessment. But if one is suspicious of Dutch elm disease attacking that tree, they can formally test for it, right? You know, that's actually a good point because if a tree dies, uh, you might assume that it's linked to Dutch elm disease. And you would want to know because that even the tree, once it's dead, it continues to act as a source of disease and the elm beetles that are present continue to fly around and spread that disease. So what you can do is go ahead and have that tree tested at K-State for the presence of the disease and then know that this is a source of disease and it needs to be removed as soon as possible. So the, the type of sample that we would want for testing, we want something that's probably about a thumb diameter, maybe half inch diameter, and I would say two to three branches, maybe about 18 inches long. And then when you collect them, they can't be completely dead and dry. They need to be just as the tree is in that process of wilting. So it takes probably after the sample arrives about a week to culture and get those results. But once you know, then, then you know for sure this is a tree that even after it dies, if it's not removed, that disease will continue to spread throughout the community. So that's the basic management strategy here to remove the tree. Uh, that's about all that one is left to do. The primary uh, management strategy is to remove the tree and to destroy the wood. So I know a lot of trees, when they die, people may think, oh, you know, I'm going to save this wood for firewood. But in this case, that's not a great idea because the fungus will survive in that dead wood for quite a while. And the elm bark beetles will also survive underneath the bark for quite a while. So if you know the tree is infected, you cut the tree down and you destroy the wood. And usually that's done by, by chipping or, or burning pretty soon. So that's your primary strategy is removing the trees. But there's another step, and that is if you have two elm trees near each other, um, I would say maybe within 50 feet, I kind of forgot to mention earlier, Dutch elm spreads through the insects, but it can also spread through root grafts. So elms that grow near each other, the roots grow towards each other and they fuse. So one infected tree, the fungus moves through the root grafts to the nearby tree. So if you have multiple trees on the same street, one's infected, there's a decent chance that it will move to the next tree and the next tree and the next tree. So in terms of management, you definitely need to remove the infected tree but you also have to come back and break the root grafts between the two trees. And then you can turn and try to protect the remaining healthy tree. So if you're in that situation, it will take some manual effort. So, but it's necessary if you want to save that second tree. Yes. And you would probably work with a commercial arborist to do some fungicide injections. And a lot of the elms that are remaining, they're huge. So they're special trees and, and it is a bit of experience of an expense, but it may be worth it because it adds a lot of value to that that home or that location. The fortunate thing, though, Judy, is that over the many years since Dutch elm disease first arrived in this region and, and took its toll, tree experts have been working at developing cultivars that have resistance to the disease, and they have had success. That's something you say to keep in mind if one has to replace an elm. American elms are are wonderful community trees, and we are still losing them to Dutch elm disease. But as you mentioned, the great thing is our research pathologists have spent decades identifying resistant American elms, and they've been successful. So now as we uh, replant into our communities, there's options like Valley Forge, 
Princeton, New Harmony, Lewis and Clark. So I would say as we go forward, we should be planting some of these American elms that are resistant to Dutch elm disease. Then we wouldn't have to deal with this as an issue every year. So Dutch elm disease, if you have American elms that you cherish within your landscape layout, be sure to be aware of the potential of that disease attacking those trees. And we appreciate the word, Judy. As always, thanks so much. Thanks, Eric. From the Plant Disease Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State, that's the director of that laboratory, Judy O'Mara, on this week's Horticulture Segment. With that, this Thursday edition comes to a close. Thanks for being along with us, and please rejoin us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.